they can strike out of the darkness without warning. There's something about that that has us hardwired to be terrified. You would never know if a shark is coming that I think both makes them scary and allows people to exaggerate the threat associated with them. Having this perception that sharks are, are targeting us, of course, makes it much more acceptable to target them. I'm thrilled to talk to you about this book, and I thought, to begin, I wanted to explain a little about how I decided to, to really explore this territory to begin with. You know, I've actually, I spent the vast majority of my reporting career here in Washington covering politicians. Many people said it was obviously a natural transition from politicians to sharks. Uh, but I think they're a great way to explore the ocean, both because they play such a vital role there, they're clearly in peril, but also because we have a connection to them in a way that we don't to a lot of other fish. I think that our relationship with them does tell us a lot about our, our broader world, and so, and, and you have a great advantage because sharks are globally distributed, and so there's so many different ways you can look at the role that they've, they've played historically in, in different regions, and, and it gives you a sense of, of human society as well as the natural world. And so in order to get a full and complete perspective on, on what has happened with sharks and, and the human shark relationship, I think it's really important to look at how they've been viewed over time, how that's changed, and also you know, get out of pr the traditional Western perspective, modern day perspective we have, which of course has been shaped by things like Jaws. And so, for example, uh, if you go back and look at the countries and communities and cultures with the most detailed uh, r and rich historic relationship with sharks, which often connect to faith traditions, they're island n cultures and, and nations, which is not, it's not surprising. What is more surprising is the fact that they have a much more nuanced relationship with sharks than, than I do. The, this is a picture of Salam Kar Simbe, a shark caller from Papua New Guinea, which is one of the few places in the world that continues to have a faith tradition centered on sharks. And in, in, in this particular tradition, where you have individuals like Salam Kar Simbe who go out in an individual ca uh, canoe, shake the coconut rattle, and really uh, deliberately try to summon sharks and, and engage in combat with them in order to bring them back for important occasions, they see sharks as very powerful and as entities that can exercise their power both for good and for ill. And I think that in many ways that's a perfectly reasonable and in some ways, you know, rational way to, to view sharks. In many of these cultures you see the, a, a really personal relationship, tribal or community or familial relationship with, with sharks where they're, in many ways, they, you know, again, will protect some individuals or communities and, and attack others. And so, for example, the Hawaiians have w one of the most elaborate folklore traditions uh, involving sharks, and they have a number of different deities. They have very powerful, broader gods. The shark god, for example, is credited with inventing surfing, which is very interesting interesting when you consider that surfing and sharks often intersect even in, in today's society. But also they have I individuals, deities called Amakua, who were operated uh, in, in a very important way on the on the village and familial level where they were basically akin to a mafia godfather. That essentially, if you paid homage to, to your amakua, that amakua in, in return would do things for you, whether it's ensure that you had a decent fish catch or protect you when you were out at sea. Or alternatively, again, you know, if perhaps the neighboring village or someone had angered you, could could exact retribution. Hawaiians had basically the most detailed uh, legends, and if you look at it, they have many variations. For example, on a particular legend, Nanua the Shark Man, who is was half half human, half shark, and ultimately ended up developing a taste for human flesh, and would warn people when they went into the water that they could run into danger. And, you know, obviously some of these, these individuals did, you know, which seems like a very understandable way they explained it. 
again, they also had in, whether it's in Hawaiian culture or Japanese or Vietnamese culture, they had the idea that sharks could protect you when you were at sea. And so you, you see this you know, across the world, and again, many of these traditions have faded uh, at this point, but they really were ways that people helped saw, you know, see the world. In medieval times, they did certainly have some focus on nature as it pertained to the forest, but when it came to the sea, that really wasn't something they paid attention to. And even when, for example, they incorporated sharks' fossilized teeth into their rituals, which they did, they had uh, the, they took the teeth and they dipped them in their wine goblets and they referred to them as gloss petre, as dragon tongue stones, they thought they came from dragons and did not know they came from sharks. And this is this moment where particularly the Western world just had no sense of, of the role that sharks played. And I think what's so interesting is, again, if you look before this period, you know, there, there was a kind of an intermediate period between kind of the more traditional island culture and, and, and the Middle Ages, where if you look at the Greeks and the Romans, they both provided some scientific and some mythical accounts of sharks. But for example, Aristotle provided uh, detailed descriptions of sharks copulating, where he talked about them going after each other like dogs, or you could look at the Greek poet Oppian, who talked about a ravenous creature, Catea, which, you know, what would um, satisfy its, its insatiable jaws. But, you know, they were at least observing and kind of translating shark behavior into their world. But in the medieval period, that, that absolutely disappeared. And so then, when the Western world re-encountered sharks, it was really through seafaring, and this was probably the worst possible way in order to reconnect with sharks. Uh, and so the image you see here is one many of you might be familiar with, Watson and the shark. I think one thing, just an artistic commentary on it, which I think uh, you know, shows you how, how unfamiliar uh, the Western world was uh, at this point in the 1700s when this painting was, was done is John Copley, who was commissioned by Brooke Watson uh, to, to do the painting. If you, if you look, he paints lips on the shark. He just really had no idea what the shark looked like. But, you know, the fact is, when asked to portray a shark, he, he really just made it up. More broadly speaking, you were just at this moment where seafarers were, were dying in shark strikes. And so you saw the first recorded shark attack in history in the late 1500s comes from a Portuguese sailor who had the misfortune uh, to fall overboard and couldn't be saved by his, by his companions. And, and then if, if you go, you know, if you look forward, there's, there are just many tales of sharks circling around uh, different ships and, and, you know, sailors either, you know, basically almost kind of like a wage dispute and uh, like a labor dispute that they complained that the captains couldn't care less if they ended up in the water with sharks and things like that. And, you know, time and time again, they were, they were seen as this threat. And in fact, in certain instances, they would also follow slave ships that were traveling from Africa to the West. And to the point that actually a member of the House of Lords basically uh, presented, an who was an abolitionist, presented an ironic petition on behalf of the sharks of Africa, basically saying, please keep up the slave trade because otherwise we're gonna run out of food to eat. And so, you know, in all these ways, sharks were seen as, you know, these negative creatures that were, were preying on, you know, whether it was slaves or sailors, people who were out at sea. But sharks were still seen as a fairly abstract threat. And what changed, in actually the United States and also a few other countries were when beachgoers started interacting with sharks. And so, for example, this is the front page from the Philadelphia Inquirer referring to a series of shark strikes off the New Jersey shore in 1916. This in some ways was the inspiration for the movie Jaws. Again, people had been familiar with sharks, but they did not know to, you know, to what extent it could be, you know, potentially something that would come up when they went to the beach. And so when you had four people who were killed within a span of 12 days, that was the moment when you really saw people think of sharks as, you know, a, a threat at any point, you know, saying government to aid fight to stamp out the shark horror is that in fact, Woodrow Wilson, who was president at the time and started his political career in New Jersey, actually, became, it came under attack for the fact that he did nothing to halt these shark strikes. And that's one thing that you see time and time again, that people somehow think that this is, this is something that you could hold politicians accountable for. He, uh, there is actually a, a couple of academics, including one at Princeton, who recently found that he in fact 
suffered a political uh, penalty in New Jersey and particularly the three counties that were most affected by the drop in tourism. And so it's just interesting to see how voters really did punish Woodrow Wilson and thought that you know there was something he could do to ensure that they could be safe at sea. One of the other really interesting things that comes up around this time is that you see the way people talk about these moments in the water with sharks changes. So for example, at the same time in the turn of the last century, there were a series of shark strikes off Australia. And the politicians there did what politicians do, you know, whether you're talking about Virginia or uh, the United States or elsewhere, which is they created what they called the Shark Menace Committee, a task force in New South Wales that was supposed to deal with this issue. And what's fascinating is initially they, they published a report and they use the terms sharks, shark accidents and shark attacks interchangeably. They use them an equal number of times roughly. And you know, it's so interesting because today, one never talks about a shark accident the way you talk about a car accident or something like that. We obviously always talk about attacks and it provides obviously a level of intentionality that you're ascribing to that incident. And you know, this in many ways, what happened is the terminology attack really took currency because there was a Sydney surgeon named Victor Coppelson, and he was called in to initially deal with some of these shark strikes. And over time, he really pressed, he developed what you call the rogue shark theory, the idea that there were sharks in the water that were hunting humans. And he really pushed, he published a, a book called Shark Attack and published this, uh, you know, kind of pressed this idea in, in the public mind that sharks were out to get us. While he was uh, effective in, in campaigning against sharks, it really was Jaws that transformed the mindset of an entire generation. This is the mechanical uh, shark, Bruce, named for Steven Spielberg's lawyer, it's worth noting. Obviously, it, it depends on what age you are, but there's, there's just no question that, that Jaws had an incredible impact on how people viewed the chances of, of being struck by a shark. When I think of why sharks are so much scarier than other potential predators of, of humans, I think it comes from the fact that they can strike out of the darkness without warning. There's something about that that uh, has us hardwired to be terrified. You know, it's interesting, while you know, grizzly bears might be scary and so are mountain lions, people do not have the same visceral hatred and, and terror associated with those animals. Or, you know, for example, polar bears, which, which can attack humans and, and did in fact in an incident, a tragic incident this summer. But, you know, it's the idea that you would never know if, if a shark is coming that I think both makes them scary and allows people to exaggerate the threat associated with them. You can slice and dice the statistics a number of different ways, but when you look at the number of lethal shark strikes every year globally, you know, uh, they have averaged five, uh, five a year in recent decades. We're actually at a, an unusually high point where we have doubled that this year, but that's still a fraction of the number of deaths from, you name it, whether you're gonna talk about the heat wave that we had here in the United States this summer, uh, going to see fireworks, defective toasters, vending machines, you know, there are many more things you might wanna be, you know, more terrified than sharks. But having, you know, ha having this perception that sharks are, are targeting us, of course, makes it much more accessible, uh, acceptable to target them. And so what you saw is that there was kind of a low level uh, you know, of recreational shark fishing in the United States in the 1950s and 60s, and it really did take off after Jaws. This is Mark the Shark Quartiano, who's a commercial charter boat captain in um, Miami. He operates off Miami Beach, and his entire business is taking, whether it's celebrities, bachelor parties, uh, you know, folks who are in for Miami for a convention, out to catch a shark. While uh, there are many other causes of shark mortality that we'll get into, Recreational fishing off the United States accounts for 200,000 sharks being killed each year, according to federal statistics. But while recreational fishing is, is significant, it's not as much of a driver as industrial fishing. When a lot of these industrial fishing vessels are putting out long lines and targeting tuna and swordfish, there's no distinction that's being made by the fish that are lured by that bait. And so uh, sharks are often getting caught in those nets or caught on those lines. And so you have millions of sharks that, that are really uh, being killed each year and, and accidentally as, as bycatch. 
But that said, there's also the in intentional uh, fishing of sharks, which certainly, while, you know, again, it's, 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 I think it's very interesting that it's really debatable whether accidental fishing of sharks or intentional fishing is, is a greater driver of shark, shark deaths each year. There's no question that there is a, a growing demand for the shark fins, and that's what you see here. This is a, a photo, some of these photos are ones that I took when I was reporting in, whether it was Hong Kong or elsewhere, looking at the fin trade. And so uh, many of you might be familiar with an Asian delicacy, shark fin soup, which has become quite a status symbol, had been something only for elites and has become increasingly popular. And it really is driving the commercial demand for sharks worldwide. So Hong Kong is where most of the, the trade is centered while they're, they're being caught all over the world. But really, about 80% of all shark fins at some point go through neighborhoods like this where you see things like Shark Fin City because you know this, this is where they can move the product most efficiently and, and there are acceptable ways to kind of route it, route it worldwide. The sharks are, are being caught you know, across the globe. This is uh, a picture of me in uh, Belize where I was actually with researchers looking at, at live sharks, but we had gone to get bait that morning just, uh, you know, so that we could catch and, and release some sharks. And there's a woman who had caught a nurse shark where she sold the fins right away but she you know, couldn't sell the body because there wasn't really the demand for meat. And this is something you see time and time again, that because the fins go for 100 times the price of the meat per kilogram, that there, you know, there's still enough of a reason to catch the sharks. And you know, I, I find this fascinating. You, you see this, that basically shark fins are an incredible commodity. This is a, uh, this is a shark being finned in, in Mexico. And it's, it's really, you know, when you consider it, it's incredibly easy to transport. You dry it out, and so it's not like fresh fish that has to be shipped right away. It's something that, you know, in poor communities, they can accumulate them over time. And then, you know, whenever a vessel comes and a trader is, is willing to pay money for it, you can, you can buy it. And so that's one of the reasons it's just become such a highly valued and, and such an easy commodity to engage in worldwide. When you look at the places where you have the many sharks, those are often the healthiest coral reef ecosystems that you're going to detect, in part because they act as what, for example, one scientist calls a garbage collector. They take out the weak and the sick, and they also interact with mid-level predators and keep things going. You think about sharks obviously consuming their prey, which they do, but I prefer to think of them having uh, their psychological role that they play in the sea. And so, for example, there's a marine biologist, Boris Worm, who has looked into the idea that sharks sometimes can just, uh, for example, in Australia, just intimidate other animals um, from uh, like such as dugons from overgrazing in a seed grass habitat. So I consider that maybe the most benevolent way in which sharks can enforce, you know, healthy ecosystems. And you know, it is worth noting that there still is a debate about exactly what role sharks play in the ocean. You know, for example, are they the same as terrestrial predators such as wolves and how we've seen the reintroduction of wolves help restore the Yellowstone, or do they play the same role as lions or tigers, you know, in Africa? And the answer is we're, you know, we're not entirely sure. And I think this is one of those areas where you are going to see more research as we move forward, and that's that's going to answer some of these questions that are still out there. Yeah.